So for those of you who are joining us, we will get started shortly. Um, we're letting people in to the webinar and uh, we will start promptly at noon. We have another minute or two for those of you who are joining us. We will get started with the webinar in just a few minutes. Uh, we appreciate you coming. So just hang in there with us for another minute or two. I think we are letting people in. Um, Maggie, if you can let us know if we um, have let everyone in the room, we'll get started shortly. Yeah, it looks like we have 16 here with us and everyone is available. So if you want to get started, this okay. is being recorded so they can jump on and rewatch if they need to. All right, thank you very much. Well, welcome everybody. This is the Nonprofit Resource Roundtable. We are going to be talking about the new updates to the Bay Area Community Foundation grant process, and we're going to do a deep dive into measuring outcomes. Just a few housekeeping tips. There we go. Thank you for changing that. This webinar is going to be recorded. We will be providing a link to the recording on our website after the webinar. So if you have somebody else in your organization who would like to watch it, it will be on our nonprofit page under helpful information for grant seekers. If you run into any technical difficulties, Maggie Duan from BACF is on the line and is uh, doing all our behind the scenes work today. So thank you, Maggie, but reach out to her via the chat, chat box. Speaking of chat box, we would prefer that you use the Q&A feature of the webinar to ask questions. That way, Christy and I will both be able to see those questions and we will answer those um, at specific breaks. So keep in mind that if you ask a question while we're speaking, we will eventually get to your question. There we go. So today we are going to learn about the um, overview of what the grant process here is here at uh, Bay Area Community Foundation. This might be a review for some of you, um, but we do have um, a couple of new steps. Um, we're also going to talk about what's new. As many of you know, we have transferred to a whole new grant application system and we are rolling it out with this grant cycle. So we're going to go over what is new from before. And more specifically, we're going to talk about measuring impact. Um, and then lastly, how to apply for a grant. Looks like I have a slight delay in, in uh, clicking the presentation. I'm not sure, Maggie, if you can correct that or not. Okay, so our application process. The first step is inquiry. Um, this is in the past has been done by either a telephone call or email. Um, you would call me, tell me a little bit about your project or program, what you're looking at funded, and then I would give you a, a password. Now you're going to submit a letter of inquiry. 
And we're going to talk in more detail about that at the next slide. Um, the next step is um, receiving an invitation to apply, and that is after your LOI is approved. Um, good news there, your information that you submit in on your LOI will be transferred to your full grant application. After you submit your grant application and the deadline closes, we will then have over 10 committees review specific grant applications. So that's kind of what happens between September 12th and November 1st. So we are still busy um, reviewing your grant applications and making those recommendations. And the committees make recommendations to our board of trustees. They will approve your your awards at the November 8th meeting. So on November 9th, you will receive an email, regardless if you received a grant or not, letting you know your determination. Um, after that, we will, um, we will work with you on um, getting your grant agreement signed, answering any questions you may have. And once we get those things accomplished, we will cut a check and you will go forth and do good things. Um, the last step in the grant process is the final report. So your final report is due when your project is complete or within one year of the grant award date. Um, so keep that in mind that that is the time frame for most of our grants. If your grant has an exception, um, you'll need to make us aware of that. So if you're applying for a two-year grant or your grant can't be completed um, in 12 months, it needs 13 months. So let us know that ahead of time. And I'll advance to the next slide. There we go. So what is the letter of intent? So we talked a little bit about that on the last side. Is it a letter or a form? It is actually an online form. It is part of our new grant system. Um, so please don't send me a letter. I have received a few already. Um, I don't want you to do any more work than you have to. So part of our process is the first step is completing that online form which the system and we call letter of intent. And it is exactly that. It, it tells us what specifically um, you're looking to have funded, when, how much, and um, it's all of that information we used to talk about on phone or through email. Um, once you submit that, I will review it. I may be um, providing feedback or I may be providing suggestions. So keep in mind when you see that email from me, that means that I want your response very quickly. The quicker you respond, the quicker that we can move through the process. Your LOI does need to be approved. And so uh, we need to try to move that process along. If I send you the email to um, go back in and look at that feedback and you don't get back for two weeks, um, you're gonna be um, a little bit behind. So keep that in mind. That's a little bit different with this, with this system. And the good news is that um, everything you put on your LOI will be transferred to your full grant application. So you're not going to have to redo that information. Um, and again, your LOI must be approved before you um, access the full application. You will receive an email that says, congratulations, move on to the full application. Down in the bottom, you'll see um, a, a little note that says plan ahead. Thank you, Maggie. Um, this step is gonna take a little bit longer than our previous system. So give yourself time. And especially with the first time doing this system, this application, it's gonna take you longer. So um, I always encourage you to plan ahead and submit your grant application early and not wait until the last minute. All right, what else is new? So closing out previous grants, um, some of you may be receiving a friendly reminder in the form of a letter in the mail today, um, or maybe you've already received it. But during the last couple of years, we have um, been a little bit lenient on getting those final grant reports in. And the reason being is you've had a lot of other things on your plate. 
Now we're looking to bring all of those past grant reports up to date. And our requirement has always been you must complete your final report before applying for additional funding. So keep in mind that you need to complete your final reports before you apply for new funding. Um, if you have questions on whether or not you have an outstanding grant report, you can always let me, either give me a call or email me and we can figure that out. So the other thing that's new is that the system is a totally online process from the LOI to the final report, the grant agreements online, it is a total online system. Um, which help us, helps us keep everything in one place. And it's helpful for you too, because you can log in at any time and access any part of that process. So you're not gonna have to say, okay, where's that form? Where's the link to the final report? I have my grant agreement, agreement in some file, where is it? So that is a, a very new feature and one that I think you'll enjoy very much. Um, application questions. So some of our questions have been tweaked either to simplify the question or clarify what we're looking for. Um, for the most part, the content is the same. Um, there is one area that is changed and that is measuring outcomes. Um, so we are kind of beefing up that section. If you remember from the past application, it was how do you plan to evaluate your grant? We are now asking you more detail about that. And with us today is Christy Kuzval and Maggie, thank, thank you, Maggie. So as you can see, Christy has a um, long resume. Um, she's a senior associate with, and correct me if I'm wrong, Christy, Cuesta? Mm -hmm. Correct. Close. Okay, yeah. yay. <laughs> um, which is a consulting firm in Chicago, Illinois, that provides technology due diligence services to provide equity services to private equity and venture capital firms. Um, as an enthusiastic entrepreneur and, and creative visionary, Christy has a broad background in helping nonprofits and small businesses start, grow, transition, and innovate. Prior to Cuesta, Christy spent five years as a consultant and manager for the SBA sponsored Small Business Development Center and 10 years as an attorney in private practice. She has also served as a board member and executive director for a local nonprofit. And here at the foundation, she has volunteered for many years as a grant reviewer on one of our committees. She lives in Bay City, Michigan with her husband and two very adorable dogs. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Christy, to talk about measuring outcomes. Great, thanks, Joni. I will go ahead and share my screen. And since that was your intro, we will give you the very cute dogs. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, most important, <laughs> the most important thing is that's Sonny and Fozzie. And that's Sonny and Fozzie and their brother, Teddy, who lives across the street from us. And you will oftentimes see them in a pack of three. So we had to, we had to include Teddy as well. Uh, they are honorary board members and they go to church meetings and they go to, they're all over town. They just got pulled over by the police. Tell Rick he's supposed to use a wear a leash. Anyway, <laughs> no. um, our agenda today. So I'm gonna cover this whole measuring outcomes piece. So we're going to start with what's the problem, how big is it, how are we going to solve it, what do you need to solve it, how do you know if you're successful, what can you measure to prove you're successful, how do you measure the intangible specifically, and an example and Q&A at the end. So I do feel free to encourage you to use the Q&A box. Um, I'm going to put some things in the chat and hopefully that will help us help you specifically so we are here to answer some of your specific questions as well. Um, and we'll take our time to do that hopefully during the session. So the very first thing in this grant application process is a description of what problem are you trying to solve? Or sometimes what benefit are you going to bring to the community? What is the change that you're trying to create? For example, um, and we're looking at this very simply in a very concise terms, like not like 17 paragraphs, um, the, you've heard the TLDR thing as a grant reviewer, too long, didn't read. 
honest, because we have like 45 applications to read sometimes in like one day. So as succinct as you can be, what's the one word? Blight, homelessness, climate change, poor community image. I think about the endeavor that Doubt undertook and the Community Foundation participated in with um, plantings and home repairs along the one ways, for example. Abandoned foster youth, property unemployment or low, poverty unemployment or low wages, divisiveness, a sense of community outrage. These are the things that we might be trying to solve for. Um, so while we're here, if you don't mind putting in the chat, in the Q&A box, actually, um, what are the problems that you're all working on in um, your organizations today? Nothing, nothing, nothing. Do we have anything in the chat, Joni? Am I just not seeing it? Who wants to play along? No, nothing. Oh, building we capacity have a to offer more programs. So capacity building. Capacity building is a very good one. Um, and we'll talk about measuring that specifically because that one can be challenging to measure. It's like, how many hours are you working? How many hours do your programs take? How many people does it take to do all the work that you need to be done? And why can't you do that with the organization Child Abuse and Neglect? Oh, absolutely. That one's definitely measurable. Um, Let's see, we do have some in the chat here, Christy. Um, DEI and STEM education is one of them. Um, assisting people with disabilities, helping community with work readiness, mental health services, facilities, car seats, place making. So there's definitely a lot coming in the chat there. Great. Thank you so much because guess what that just did? That helped me see that understanding the problem you're solving and the solution you're providing to solve that problem are a great area. Be sure when you're describing the problem, such as DEI education, what's the problem? The education is the solution. Car seats are a solution to a problem, to unsafe children. So let's start with the problem because the problem can be quantified. How bad is the problem before we can talk about the solution? Because guess what? Your solution should make the problem go away or should reduce the extent of the problem. So the problem should be measurable as well. And how do we quantify that problem? For example, comparative demographics. Uh, comparative, meaning one time period to another time period. In other words, this, this is changing for the worst, such as unemployment. If unemployment is going up, that means we have a growing problem. If it's going down, that means the problem is being solved, comparing one time period to another time period. It could also be relative demographics, relative numbers, one community, our community versus another community of a comparable size. Um, low educational attainment, that's the one that's particularly um, of importance to the Bay Area Community Foundation, and I'll get to the demographics a little bit later. But for example, we saw that Bay County, Bay Area counties had a very low college attainment rate compared to communities of similar size and age across the country. So we wanted to focus on improving that for our community, looking at the before number getting to the after number. For example, it was 18% in 2010, it is now 19.7%. We moved the dial, making the problem not as bad. Comparative property values, for example, if we're trying to improve blight, um, you can look at, all of these are free, by the way, all these data sources are free and public and they should be known to you in your organizations. They should be on your news feeds and in your newsletters of your organizational network. Um, they shouldn't be too hard to find. Um, for example, reports of domestic violence or child abuse, those statistics are public. They may be the um, state, it may be the local county, it may be local crime statistics published by a, a township or city police department, or it might be national crime statistics. Um, voter turnout, that's a big one I know that, that's public information, county clerk and secretary of state records. Or for example, something like teenage loitering. How do you measure that? Today we have social media. We can say there were 47 tweets last year, last week. You can search the records and say about teenage loitering, blah, blah, downtown or destructive property or property destruction or um, things like that. So you can measure that over time and say there were 47 of these reports last year and we need to reduce that by at least half this year or 
something similar. So it's quantifying the problem statement. And as you can see, the problem is a little different than the solution. So what we get into next is how are you solving the problem? So for example, if the condition you're changing is knowledge, capacity, ability, what you wanna do is increase that knowledge. If there's a lack of knowledge, it's DEI. So there's diversity, equity, inclusion is a lack of knowledge or a lack of awareness. So what we're doing is we're creating a class or an event or a series of classes or activities to raise that awareness. How do we measure, here's a good question in the question box. How do we measure material resource needs like diapers, feminine hygiene products, laundry soap, car seats? I will get to that momentarily. That's a great question, Marlene, thank you. For example, if the condition you're changing is homelessness, blight, improved community image, what you're doing is creating a new building or an improvement to a building or painting a park or painting a, a building or a, creating a new ramp. Um, for handicap accessibility, something like that, a playground, an art installation, that's changing the face of the community. A decrease in poverty, employment, higher wages. You're doing or creating volunteer services, counseling, support, some form of service. Improve cultural understanding, interpersonal. I would see you, I got concrete and then more, more and more vague. What you're gonna create here is a publication or video or performance. What we get to next is inputs and outputs. And Marlene, this is where I get to your, your question, because I think it's very easy to, to count material resources. You just say, how many? How many people did you serve? How many um, items did you give away? How many times did one person come back? Let's, we'll get to this in a little more detail in a second, because this goes directly from inputs to your project. Well, first you probably need money. That's why you're coming to the community foundation. And in some cases I could, I would love to have this debate over like lunch someday, lunch, brunch. And I would love to see if someone can come up with more buckets than this, but I'm, I'm boiling this down to four buckets. And this could be because I have, I have a bent toward finance. And in, in finance, we measure things in bigger buckets because it gets too detailed sometimes if you make it too narrow. So first there's money. Second, there's property or stuff or things. So like paper, um, pens, um, clothing, like there's literally just things. Then there's labor or human service. And then there are ideas, which is intellectual property. So oftentimes, believe it or not, I will set up back in the day, small business bookkeeper records in those exact type buckets because when comparing benchmarks to other organizations, how are we doing? What are we spending on labor as a percentage of sales? What are we spending on SG&A or sales general and administrative expenses? That's the stuff. What is our, what is our IP or our intellectual property value as a ratio of all of our total assets? These are just basic categories of inputs that you need for your project. Don't ever forget labor. Just because your team can do it, Scott Ellis, this goes to capacity. They can't do everything. There are only 40 hours in a week. Don't overwork your team. They're going to burn out. You can't afford to lose labor right now. So you have to count all of the things that they are doing every day. If you have to do a time study, this is painful. But I made my staff do it at the YWCA back in the day. They didn't, they all quit, but that was only for a second. <laughs> it wasn't because of the time study. It was literally. I need to know what you're doing. They weren't in the office all the time. They were on the road working on programs. They were working on events. And it can be a rough estimate. Say, okay, two hours on this, half of my day I spent on this, half of my day I spent on this. It doesn't have to be in six minute increments like me as a lawyer would obsess over. But basically knowing what you're spending your time doing. If you don't record your time spent toward like, for example, a fundraising event, then you're not adequately recording the return on investment of that event keep track of the time it takes to get this done, especially in this more service-based um, economy. Now, how do you know if you're successful? This is the meat and potatoes of your report at the end of the grant cycle. And we wanna know what you're going to be successful at ahead of time with goals, right? So what are our goals? So if our measurable outputs, and this Marlene will help you understand what we're getting to. If it's an event or activity, you have participants, the number of participants or the number of participant hours. 
The reason that's important is because sometimes you might have a class that only has eight or 10 participants in it, but what if that class is 13 weeks long and you see them three hours at a time? The most important hour, the point there is hours. They, that, those people came away changed from that semester's experience. It's not about the eight or 10 people that we're financing. It's a long-term big deal program. Funds raised, that's in events. How many new dollars were raised in that event um, or how many uh, friends were raised, right? Number of homes planted, number of homes painted, trees planted, that's pretty easy. But also don't forget before and after pictures, that measures change. And that's a data source. Visual data is still data. And I love pictures, especially here's a secret. Take your before pictures in the winter on a cloudy day. Take your after pictures in the summer on a sunny day, right? Before they mow the lawn and then after they mow the lawn. Be very careful and very cognizant, Avram Golden, you should do it for everybody. Or like someone in the room, make sure you take really good after pictures. Your before pictures can be terrible. Um, community sentiment, this is my favorite. Surveys or assessments or social media polls. You can now poll people with two clicks on a social media page or uh, create a free doodle poll or free. There are so many free tools out there for measuring how the community feels or what they think. If you need help developing a survey, I highly recommend engaging SPSU. They have statistics classes, classes, they have students, business classes, business students and whatnot are also very capable of developing questions to poll the audience for how they feel or what they think. The marketing programs, especially measuring what they think before and what they think afterward or what they think of a product, great at coming up with those questions. Services, obviously the number of individuals or families served, hours of volunteer services provided. I think that's very important when you're doing a community event like, um, like a, um, a race. I looked at for a 5K um, or anything like that. You wanna know how many volunteers are participating, how many volunteers are painting homes, how many students are volunteering for mentoring programs or a tutoring program. And again, funds raised, don't forget about that one. Because oftentimes now nonprofits are expected to have income generating programs for themselves. That's a good thing. This is not a bad, it's not a bad thing for an organization to make money, to pay yourself. And so that's where you come to, if you're raising money on those programs, but it's not enough to cover the full program, it's okay to raise the money. For example, we're charging each participant $30 a week for a camp. Well, that's not gonna pay for the camp. The camp is $150 per person, but the organization is supplementing that with grant funding. That's a very honest and way to say it because we're trying to support the community with a program they wouldn't have be able to afford otherwise. Intangible works. Again, number of participants affected. If this is an audience, try and measure your audience as well as possible, whether it's registration, even if they don't have to pay for something, make them register in advance. You also now have their name and email address. If you, if you have someone, if it's an open to the event, um, I'm thinking the dry dock, count heads, have someone at the door counting heads. So that's a part of your event is how many people are affected. Community sentiment, again, that's one of my favorites and funds raised, obviously. So outputs, when it's a material resource, Marlene, you literally count out how many things you gave away. How many things did you give away? How many families were affected? How many individuals were affected in those families? For example, if you're helping a family of six and giving them three different resources, that's six individuals who are assisted. So that's not just one family, that's six individuals. Also, if you gave them three different sets of, of resources, diapers and feminine hygiene products and laundry soap and a car seat to that one family, you have truly made a change in that whole family's lifestyle. I would survey that family afterward or even interview them and ask how that impacted their lives. So that's another data point is a story. I said it here in the collective, which is community sentiment or community input, but don't forget about the individual stories. Those oftentimes are just as important to your stakeholders as the actual numbers. And sometimes they're easier to actually celebrate and feel emotionally connected to your organization with. Joni, any other thoughts on that? Uh, you hit on, on our final report, we do ask for a human story. So um, keep that in mind. We, that is important. 
in terms of reporting the success of your programs. Yeah. And don't be afraid to ask folks, the people that you're serving, they can report anonymously. If they don't want to be identified, they don't have to be identified. They can say um, mother of six from Bay County. They, they don't, but you can also say they're getting something for free and they needed help. So of course they want to thank you. Here's how you can thank us. Could we please share your story? We don't have to identify you. Or perhaps here's a photo of the family. If they are happy to say, we are so happy that we received your help. Thank you. This was a very difficult time in, in our lives and we're happy to share that you helped us, sometimes a photo. But again, it can be anonymous. Intangibles. This is one of the hardest things because this is where I know a lot of our nonprofits get very esoteric. You're all brilliant people. And sometimes, don't worry, I'm with you on this, overthink things and make it a little like harder and more like abstract than it needs to be. So if it's something like knowledge and skills acquired, tests, you assess someone before and after, and it can be a five question assessment. How do you feel you are at this? Good, bad, otherwise. It, a, an assessment doesn't have to be a complicated test. It can be a three or four question that these are your measurable outcomes. Because if you're doing a class, you have to have measurable outcomes. It's like a curriculum for any other um, educational event. What are the outcomes you want to achieve? If it's an increase in awareness of this, how does the participant feel beforehand? How do they feel afterward? This is... Um, the state of Michigan, for example, gives out funding for um, a number of programs, uh, community initiative programs and educational programs, especially in the child abuse and neglect space. If you're writing a grant application for um, the state of Michigan, they're going to, that's exactly what they require is they need, what are your outcomes and what are your pretest? And that's a complicated one in some cases. And what is your post test? You can also buy these. They should come with your curriculum if you're buying a curriculum from a third party. You can also get a lot of these from other organizations in the space you're operating in that work on a national level. Go dig the internet and research. Don't create something from scratch. Don't, don't be afraid to borrow and flattery is, wait, what is it? Um, imitation is the best form of flattery. Don't be afraid to just borrow some from someone else. Just say, this is adopted from so-and-so. This is, if you're the local YMCA, the National YMCA has tools for you. If you're a local organization working in the um, child abuse and neglect space, there's national organizations working on child abuse and neglect. Borrow and steal broadly from them. It's the nonprofit environment. You don't have to create anything from scratch. Also ask for help. There are community resources. Um, I believe that the United Way has a human services collaborative, if I'm not mistaken, or used to. Others working in your space, collaboration with the other partners in your in your organization or in your community space and in your initiative, oh my gosh, we would love to see collaboration. Sit down for a coffee with someone who's working on something and how did you do it? Or could you help me think through this? Ideating sometimes, coming up with those ideas can be the hardest part, at least it is for me. Thoughts and feelings, um, the smiles on their faces. Yes, that's not measurable, sorry. I, I love the sentiment but we need to hear it from them. We need to hear it from the participants. We need to hear it from the people who are affected. We need to hear it from the people who are impacted by this, by surveys and polls. For example, the one ways. We've been dealing with the, the one way issue in this community. I've lived here for 40 some odd years. We won't reveal exactly how long. How do we feel when we're driving in and out of town? Well, I don't know if you've seen the big, huge, giant field of daffodils in the spring. You need to survey someone when they drive through in the spring and be like, that is amazing. We need to like put a bulletin board up and say, you know, if you like this, like this page or something like that. That is a huge community sentiment thing that changes the impression of this community simply by planting wild, planting flowers, wildflowers in the middle grounds. Same thing. They didn't change the world. They didn't affect people. They didn't give anything away. They planted wildflowers. It's amazing. If you surveyed me, I go over that bridge all the time. I'd say this is an amazing thing for the community. Thank you so much to the Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy. So thoughts and feelings. Don't You got to measure. You got to use social media. Get on Instagram. 
put your pictures out there, say, how do you feel about this? Get on all of the social medias that you can, where you can interact with people and have your friends and followers share that broadly um, or use a tool with your email, with your email list. So if you have constant contact or if you just have a database that has email lists in it, send them a two question survey and go there and um, doodle or doodle. Pull. No, what is, there's a whole bunch of them. Survey monkey. Survey monkey is so easy to use. And there are, once you do one, all of a sudden your juices start flowing and you learn how to ask more and different questions in different ways with bulleted lists or with a rating scale on a scale of one to five. How did you feel about this? Um, yeah, surveys and polls are one of my favorite things. And a before and after transformation, photos and interviews. Always submit those if they're available. They should There should be hopefully a place to upload that in the report. Yeah, Joan. Okay, good. And the committee loves those. So the committees love to see that. I'll state that from a, a committee standpoint. So what you have to do though, is you have to know what problem you're solving and how you're solving it and simplify that as much as possible. Keep it, boil it down to its essence. The, the least amount of effort you can, you can make your cognitive load you can put on the committee, the better. Keeping it simple, making it complex does not make you sound smarter. It does not make you sound like you're doing more than you're really doing. Being honest and transparent and direct is so appreciated. So I might be the only one who really feels that way. I'm pretty sure. Now, here's a good example. I love, I love to use the, this own organization as an example because are they doing what they say they want you to do? Yes, they are. And we'll show you how. How does the Community, community Foundation do it? Because they have a very esoteric, very large mission. Their vision is huge. The United Thriving and Resilient Community. And their mission is generosity, leadership, and strategic grant making. The vision is the condition you're changing and the mission is what you're doing. How do we know if they're successful? Well, reporting on their SMART goals. So here's what they do. They say they're specific, just like SMART goals are specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-bound, so is their report. They are specific in that they have how, much, how many dollars were spent. So they spent 1.5 million in grants and $500,000 in scholarships. And so, in more detail, they break it down into exactly what went and where those dollars went. They were specific and strategic. If you remember, how does, what is their vision? A th united, thriving, and resilient community. All of these categories is what the board of directors years ago decided, this is what we mean when we say united, thriving, and resilient. Those are very abstract concepts that could be defined in very different ways. They had a committee that decided this is what it looks like. And so here's how we're spending money, putting money where our mouth is. And we're trying to change the conditions. Maybe the community wasn't so united. Maybe the community was divided. That was the problem. We want to be more united. How do we become more united? We become well. We invest in community wellness. We invest in arts and culture, our education and youth. How do we become more thriving? Recreational opportunities, the environment. And then how are we resilient? Again, environment, health and wellness, human services. We need human services to be a resilient community. What was the problem? The problem was that people were suffering and not getting the help they needed. We weren't able to bounce back from catastrophe. We weren't able to basically meet our basic needs after a tragedy. With these services, we are. And so actually, when you go to this report, this is from last year, the 2021 annual report. And when you go there, they break it down in even more detail of what organizations received these grants. That way they're being fully transparent to their stakeholders and their stakeholders, meaning their donors and their volunteers, because the community foundation has a ton of volunteers, can feel as though their time and effort and resources are going to support the community in the ways that they expected. So, I think the Community Foundation does a great job reporting on its activities. And early on, they had done deep studies into some of these problem statements. And those are out there. They're white papers. Those are kind of more complicated. I didn't put them up here because they're not pretty. But they did quantify the problem by stating, for example, our low educational attainment. At one point, Joni, I could be wrong. I feel like we used an old census and it was like 15.3%, which was 
terrifyingly below the national average. And so that big, huge effort toward the capital campaign for the um, Bay Commitment Scholarship was really well anchored in one really scary statistic. So you don't need a lot. You don't need a lot of numbers. You need core numbers that truly mean something with respect to the impact you're making on the community. So that was fast. The rest of the time we can spend on Q&A and um, helping you flesh out your grant applications, your questions, or the metrics that you're wondering, how do you measure your success? So Christy, while those questions are coming in, I just want to let people know that we're asking you to identify what you're going to measure in your grant and what the outcomes are in your application. So it's not something that you figure out at the end when you're doing your final report. We want you to have that decided upon when you apply. So you need to give some thought to that. Um, and there's just two questions on the new grant application about that. What are, are you measuring? How are you measuring it? And what's your outcomes? So um, Christy, you did a great job on explaining how you might drill down and do some of those things. Um, so let's look at uh, any questions. I know you have questions out there. Anyone want to give an example that we could work through? How many grant submissions include partnerships? That's a good question, Eva. Yeah, you know, that is a good question. A metric so, we could measure. Yeah, so we like to see organizations that are doing similar things as another organization come together and do a partnership. Um, but there are certainly uh, grants where there are partnerships. That you're the organization that has the knowledge and the expertise, and you're going after that problem. So in terms of partnerships, if I was to quantify it, Maybe 25%. What would you say, Christy, after reading all those grant be, applications? I wouldn't be that high. I'd say maybe 10%. 10%. Yeah. And it's it's primarily the organizations that serve the region or that do something more foundational or sustainability based. Um, those are the ones that tend to what we and I'll tell you why. And that's I don't necessarily think it's necessarily bad because what we're very conscious of in these committee meetings is ensuring that there is no duplication services. And if there is, that means there's a very compelling need. For example, there's a new organization coming to town that is going to be using the USDA program for feeding um, children, basically providing extra meal support. And when they called me, I said, oh, are you already aware that our YMCA is doing that? Are you, they're using the same funding pool and I'm about to call my, my congressman as be like, hey, hey, hold on. Before the USDA funds another program in this tiny community, we need to make sure the existing one is reporting how many meals. Is, I went to the Y's website and said, how many meals is the Y serving? How many people are coming back every day? Um, what about the, and there's um, a couple more organizations that are doing the, feed, the, the food programs. And we need to quantify the hungry problem before we bring in another organization that's going to take the same funding source and do the same thing with it. Because the administrative function of a nonprofit is $75,000 a year minimum. That's how much it takes just to have the doors open and the lights on. Even if you don't own a space, renting a space and paying an executive director and having the insurance that you need for a board of directors for you know, insurance, minimum, and this was, this was this is my 2020 or my 2018 number was 75,000. Today it's probably closer to 100. So the administrative dollars that go to into duplicating efforts is something the committee will look at very carefully if they're trying to give they're being asked to give money to an organization that does something that's already being done in the community. We will educate those organizations and say you're a new nonprofit. Maybe you aren't aware of the Helen Nichols Clinic that already does this thing that you say you're going to do new. You know, were you aware? You know, were you aware that this is going on? Were, and a lot of times they're not. So partnerships are not that common. 
Sometimes maybe they should be. It'd be interesting. And during COVID, we saw a lot more partnerships, um, and specifically with the food distribution. Um, we really saw those organization, organizations come together, share resources to meet the need of the community. And so it was a great example of how partnerships can work. The other one I love to see is the sharing of administrative resources. CMURC providing low cost co work space for nonprofits now. Um, the chamber and the um, economic development organizations now sharing a space. Like, that's brilliant. The more we can do of the reducing the administrative burden of a nonprofit, sharing a bookkeeper, um, sharing a receptionist, or sharing a program officer, um, that's, you know, we're, we're running out of resources in this community, especially volunteer and human resources. So that's super important. Okay, any, any last call for questions or maybe an example you want us to work through? Um, and if not, we can move on to the next section. Um, I know you provide a lot of information to think about and it might take the grantees a couple of minutes to say, how does this relate to me? Yes, Gail. Okay. I was just going to say that the slides will be emailed after the presentation. Um, so if you want to take those, look at those over notes, feel free. Um, Joni, you emailed me a really good resource as well, which was another community foundation that had a good resource um, that was more of a white paper. So if you wanted mm -hmm. to do that link too, that would be. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so there was one question before we go on to how to apply. Any specific grants we should apply for when creating something new the community needs? Not any specific grants. Our process is usually a one grant application for many, um, many endowment funds. So depending, Marlene, on what you're trying to create, um, we can have a conversation about where we think that funding may fit. But speaking of applying for grants, let's talk about applying for grants. So we have a new grant portal. To get to our grant portal, the easiest way is to go to our website, which is baybfoundation.org. Up at the very top right-hand corner, you are going to see some words. If you look at the third word, nonprofits, that takes you directly to our nonprofit page. So that's where the link to this presentation will be. We also have other helpful information for our nonprofits. Um, down at the very end, you'll see the word grants portal. That is our new system. You will notice right next to it, there's a committee portal. Um, that is actually our old system. You can no longer apply through grants through that system, but you can access your previous grant applications. I know some of the nonprofits will use their previous application, cut and paste, and put it in the new application. You're only going to be able to access that information for about another month, and then it will be gone. I will not have access to it. You won't have access to it. So if you haven't printed a copy of your application in the past, now's the time to go into the old portal under committee portal um, to do that. And we label that committee portal because we have some scholarship committees that usually print off quite a few, uh, few pieces of material. So um, the grants portal, that's going to take you to a login page. That login page looks similar to our old page, but it's new. Every person who wants to apply for a grant needs to com complete a new account. Your old login and password will not work in the new system. And I've already gotten calls. I keep logging in and it says I can't find my account. Create a new, new account. It will ask you for your personal information and then your organizational information. The good news is there's no approval process. You can move right on to the apply page. And so after you click submit, you will be dropped into the apply page. The apply page will list all of our open grant opportunities. So you're going to kind of scroll down to find the one that fits what you're looking to have funded. Um, one change is our grant uh, opportunity used to be called semi-annual grant. It is now called community partnership grant. 
So if we do have anybody who wants to apply for funding for Aranac County programs or projects, we do have a separate application for Aranac County. So keep that in mind, it's called Aranac County Community Partnership Grants. So you're gonna scroll down. Uh, we are working on formatting of that right now. It's really big. So it doesn't look like you scroll down, but if you scroll down, you'll see another and another. Um, so that will list all of the open grant applications. Uh, once you do that, you're gonna click Submit. And the first step of the process is the LOI. Um, keep in mind, um, you must submit your LOI no later than September 6 at 11.59 p.m. Um, once you have your LOI approved, and that could be on September 6 or after or way before, the actual submission of your grant application is September 12th at 11.59 p.m. So I know those two days can get a little confusing. Keep in mind, we want to get your LOI approved first, give you some more time to complete your full application. So that's why there's a week difference. However, we do not recommend that you wait until September 6 to submit your LOI. This is a new process. It's going to take you longer um, just for the fact that it's new. So keep that in mind. Don't wait. Plan ahead. Plan ahead for technical difficulties, not knowing where to find information. Um, so now's the time to uh, begin that process. And then we're going to move on to a couple other reminders. We do have one question from Sue. Does the application have to be for new, initi new initiatives or programs, or can we continue or expand a program? So the answer to that is it does not have to be a new initiative. Um, but what we're looking at, if you're looking to continue the same program, we do have some funds that will fund the same program over and over and over. Most of the times we don't usually do that. We wanna look at how are you gonna sustain this program? Um, because the community foundation doesn't have a, a large operating where we can support programs year after year, but there are some funds and I'll give you an example, the Elizabeth Husband Fund. They fund Christmas joy. So they will fund Christmas parties for kids year after year. Um, you don't have to recreate the wheel there. Um, but if you're looking for expanding program, that's certainly worth um, a, a look at that. If you have questions about that, um, just pick up the phone, and give me a call. I'm more than happy to talk with you about that idea and how to um, apply for that. Okay, Maggie, if there's any other questions that pop up um, before we're done, just let me know. So reminders. So another resource that we have is Catch a Fire. If you're not familiar with Catch a Fire, it is something that is um, offered and paid for through the ACF. It is free to nonprofits. And this helps you to build that capacity that you may not have on staff. So Catch a Fire matches professional volunteer talent with nonprofits to help with their needs. Some examples of that um, and Sue says Catch Fire has been great to work with. Um, people, uh, nonprofits who have used the program love it. So some examples of those, I believe that Sue had the, their website redesign. Um, maybe you need help with fundraising. How do you uh, set up an annual appeal letter? Um, maybe you need help with um, creating a new fundraising event. Um, also employee um, handbooks or policies. Uh, they also have an option where you can actually just have a one hour consulting. So they have a whole list of suggestions or ideas on things that you may need help with as a nonprofit. Again, this is free of charge for the nonprofit. We only have a, a certain number of spots. So if you are interested, we would love to offer this to you as a nonprofit. Erin Kreitzberg is a person who is in charge of that program. And so you would just give Erin a call or email and she'll give you either answer your questions, give you more information or sign you up for the program. And uh, we've had a couple of nonprofits on this call that have utilized the program 
and have found it very helpful. Again, this is one way for us to help you with those things where it may not be your expertise. You know, we want you out there doing services and doing what you do best. Um, we don't expect you to have an accountant on staff or a marketing person on staff. That's what this program is for. The next reminder is that 211 has asked us to um, let you know that they are updating all of their materials. If you have not registered with 211, you're registered your nonprofit with 211, now would be a good time to do that. Um, Shirley Southworth from 201 is doing that updating. Um, you can go right to that link or you can email Shirley directly. And then yesterday we had another webinar and if you were on that webinar, thank you for coming back today. Uh, we rolled out our Bay County ARPA nonprofit grant program. That grant application actually will open on Monday, but we do have one more in-person information session. So that is gonna happen on August 30th and the uh, link to register is at the bottom of the page. Okay. Um, Christy, do you have any last comments that you would like to add? Nothing for me, but thank you very much. It's been a joy to work oh. with the Community Foundation. Well, thank you for saying that. So I would like to thank Maggie, who's been behind the scenes, making sure that everything works. Um, Maggie did a lot of prep time ahead of that webinar to make sure that it went smoothly. And of course, I'd like to thank you, Christy, for providing us information on this um, sometimes mystifying process of measuring outcomes. Um, you really helped break it down to what those pieces and parts are. And I would also like to thank you, the nonprofits. I know your time is very valuable. Um, if you didn't know, today is National Nonprofit Day, and we want to take this opportunity to recognize you and your hard work that you do to better, better our community. And so thank you very much for all that you do, as well as attending the, the workshop. Um, I hope you have learned how you can partner with BACF through our grants program to um, you know, do your work. Uh, we will be emailing a link to this recording. And um, if you have any questions, I am always available. Um, at this point in the grant cycle, which is nearing the end, uh, the quickest way to get a hold of me is by telephone call. I know sometimes it's easier to send an email, um, but I'm expecting um, a high volume in these next couple of weeks. So if you get me on the phone, you, you've got my full attention. So uh, with the new grant cycle, with ARPA rolling out and the end of uh, the grant cycle, we, we expect to be uh, very busy, um, but we're here for you. So if there's something that we can help you with or if you have questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. And with that, I'd like to wish you a good day and thank you for attending.